If you stand between the choir stalls and look up, you see the floor of the ringing chamber and you have to go up 40 steps up a spiral staircase to reach it. If you climb a further 26 steps, you come to the clock chamber, which also houses the old Carolyn. From the clock chamber, a ladder which is at first very steep and finally vertical gives access to the belfry. The belfry is filled by a metal bell frame and the bells are fastened by their headstock to this frame. Here you can see a little under half the bell frame with the bells removed. The large flat piece of elm wood on the top of the bell is called a headstock. At the bottom of both sides of the headstock you can see a metal rod sticking out and this is called a gudgeon. The gudgeons sat in bearings fastened to the bell frame and the tower keeper had to oil these every two to four weeks. Here you see a gudgeon and bearing from the fifth and sixth bells. In this diagram the bell wheel is fastened to one side of the headstock and the stay to the other. Underneath the bell is an almost horizontal, slightly curved piece of timber called a slider. Roger is holding the bottom of the ladder steady while Graham removes some floorboards from the belfry to find a convenient piece of bell frame to attach the hoist. There are two layers to the floor of the clock chamber. The top layer is loose boards and the underneath layer is a solid square of timber. For a moment you can see down into the ringing chamber but the boards are put back to make the area safe and the hook on the end of the hoist is now lowered right the way down to the church floor. There are two layers to the trap door in the ringing chamber as well and with them removed you can look right down to the organ. The ringing chamber trap door is open. You can see the rope that's come all the way down from the bell frame right the way down to the church floor. After the wheel, stay, support bars and slider have been removed from a bell, it is ready to be lowered to the church floor. A hoisting frame is set up over the bell and then the bell is lifted clear of the bell frame. Boards are removed from underneath the bell and the clapper can then be removed from the larger bells and the lower half of the wheel also removed. Bells are removed from the belfry as far as the clock chamber using the hand hoist.
Roger is pulling the bell clear of some of the clock workings. From the clock chamber to the floor of the church, the electric hoist does the work. Graham and James prevent the bell or the headstock from hitting the sides of the trap door. As soon as the bell has cleared the trap door, the hole is covered over and made safe. As the bell passes through the ringing chamber, James now makes certain that it doesn't hit the sides of the trap door in this floor as well. Bells 1 to 6 have now all been removed and the hoist is being set up over the 7th bell. The 7th antenna will stay in the church and the work that needs to be done to them will be done in the belfry. The the work are you going to do when you've lifted the bells a bit? Uh, uh, these tops will be levelled, these pieces will be cut off, and then a resin pad, a circular resin pad, will be cast around the top of the bell, about that deep, and then the headstock, the new one, will be bolted on the top of that. That's the clapper that's just been taken out of the seventh bell. Everything that has been removed from the bells has now to be lowered down one floor at a time and taken away. Why were you making that hole larger? When we put the new headstock on, it gives us adjustment to get the clapper in the right place. Right. So we can true it up to true striking. Now the next thing is to cut all this lump off. This is what I should put yeah. on the top. Yeah. <laughs> 
So you put that on the top as a mould. Place that on there, seal it round, mix up the resin and pour it in, and then it will set. How hard is that resin? Oh, very. It's hard as metal. So although it's as hard as metal, it still takes the the vibrations, the sort well, of the stinger. Put a, we should put an insulation pad between. This is this is resin on here. Was that we, when we end up, we paint it blue, and then we put an insulation pad or there or there oh, in I, between. You see, that's that. That's a fibre. That pad wood or, coloured. Yeah. Or on the bigger ones like that over there, that actually has got wood in it. Depends how thick it's going to mm. be. So that is actually timber. And what timber is that that you've used on that, well, that belt? That's Iroko. How do you spell that? I-R-O-K-O. On these, we shall find, find dead centre and then bore a big hole through again, like I've done with that one. And then we'll slice that lump off. And then we've got to tip it over and get inside and get all the rest, any iron that's left in there, drill the iron out. That's a new blank platform. According to what length we want, and they, they go up in sizes, and as they go up, the ball size gets bigger. The 90 on there is 90 millimeters diameter. Then we go to a 95, 100, 105, and so on. And as they get bigger, they also get slightly longer. And we can drill in that area and put that's where we'll put the pivot point. The pin. It's it's a good quality exterior grade paint. We, everything gets painted three times. It starts off red undercoat, red primer, yes. then blue undercoat, and then blue top coat. Um, but it's just air trade colour. Each bow firm has its own colour. What is it you're actually doing, James? Well, I'm marking out the shroud in the bits that go on the outside of the wheels. They go on the side here. Yeah. I want to get these three done. I'm supposed to be taking them to work chapter five. Yeah. Starting with a treble bell, which as well as being significantly sharp compared to all the rest of the peel, in its, its nominal, its, mm. its name note, um, it's also got a particularly flat, what we call second partial, which is the strike note. Okay. Um, and when he does further work to um, flatten the hum in the bell, which is also very sharp, um, that second partial would also tend to go down with it. So what he's doing is he's actually skirting the bell to raise both the second partial so that when he cuts it back, he's got a bit more scope to work with. And when he's tuning them, I presume it's not just done by ear, he's going no, he's, to... Ben's have... actually using a little computer program now mm. to um, take a sound bite WAV file from the bell by pitching it, striking it with, with a hammer, get the computer to analyse that sound bite and tell him all the frequencies. Uh, he then has to make sure that he spots the right five frequencies that he's aiming to work at and make sure that he's picked them up right and then compare those to what he wants to achieve and then decide where next to cut. So he'll take a cut on the bell, he'll then pitch it again to see how things are progressing, then decide where to cut next, cut again, pitch again, so pitch and cut, right. pitch and cut. Normally it takes about a day to tune a bell. What keys are Right, the tenor is in D, I believe. I think it's D, yeah. yeah. Oh. So your bells are D, E, F sharp, mm. G, A, B, C sharp, D. Every, oh, yeah. every peel of bells is very slightly on a different pitch standard than every other peel of bells. Mm. Apart from you know, severely modern bells tend to be tuned to a modern pitch standard. But in the old days, they came so when, you, they when came. you're talking about a modern pitch standard, you mean if somebody was to use a tuning fork, in, it yes, would if you if you have it, but tuning, within itself, oh, it's if it's you have one of these. This is a D, but that is only a D at a certain pitch standard, and that's the modern pitch standard of A at 440 cycles per second. Right. So, not only is it the D at that pitch standard, but it's a D at a certain temperament, equal temperament. This would be the A. That's effectively the most standard one because that's the pitch standard they're talking about, A at 440 cycles. If that was a different pitch standard, it'd be very, very slightly sharp and very, very slightly flat, but it'd still be an A, mm -hmm. 
but it wouldn't be a international standard pitch, it would be a, some other standard pitch. But the thing is, if Peter Bells has any of a run on his own, you don't play them along with another musical instrument, so they don't have to be in tune with anything else, they just have to be in tune with each other. And your bells, unfortunately, aren't particularly, with the front three, three. being conspicuously um, sharp compared to the rest. Now, they were asking me about what note they were, and I said they're in D, but they're not yes. as they're standard a, pitch D, are they? They're a flat D, yes. Um, pitch standards have varied over the years anyway, by a semitone or even more, but by international standard, they're nearer D than anything else. But I, I think what must have happened was if we were sent just a, a black fork that had been tuned to your tenor, and we'd have assumed that the existing five would have been stretched a bit and carried on from there, but your existing five are actually compressed rather than stretched, which is... Well, there's a big gap between three and four. So that's why you've ended up with a big gap between three and four. What have you done so far on there? Um, just done some skirting cut. So you've used the high-tech method of hitting it with a spanner. Dead with the clamps on. Oops. This computer program uh, gives you a readout of the frequencies within the bell. Yeah, it does a, a Fourier analysis. Uh, and there's a built in microphone. Uh, it's not got to be a particularly good quality microphone because it doesn't matter if it distorts the strengths of the frequencies, it's the actual frequencies themselves that, that I'm using this to measure. A series of spikes for each yes. of the frequencies within the bell. Five, five main frequencies. The bottom of the bells have, they look as if they've been chewed. Mm. Um, what's that from? Because it's not where the clapper can hit it. Uh, well, it'll either be because the bell was cast with a bit of a fin around the outside and the bell fender would have just knocked the, uh, the fin off to produce a, a, well, a slightly smoother surface or it can be where the bell founder has uh, chipped away to actually raise the strike note of the bell for tuning because uh, you can either chip the corner off of the lip of the bell to raise the strike note or chip the inside of the sound bow to lower the strike note um, and what would have been done then is the bells were uh, as each one was tuned they were set up uh, all the way around in a row and tapped around and people would actually walk down some of the side streets down uh, outside the foundry and listen to them from a distance and say oh yeah I think the third bell wants flattening a bit and the fourth one sharpening or whatever. That was really mm. hit and miss wasn't it? Very, yes. It will affect the quality of the bell. I, um, this is the partial tones. Yes, yeah. yeah the, um, if the partial tones are wild, then the bell will probably sound pretty really disgusting. Um, whereas if they are um, if the second partial is in line, for instance, then it will give the bell a much better pitch definition. Mm. You know, because I mean, if, if the second partial was a long way out, you hear the bell and you think, well, I'm not quite sure what note it is, because it just sounds so horrible. Um, because the, this is the, the frequency that should be the same as the strike note, and it should be the same as the half nominal, but it can be out either way. And, it, and, it's, and, and similarly, if the hum notes are very sharp, could, the bell starts to sound a bit watery. What a lovely expression, the hum mm. notes. The Yes, well, the hum notes are the, are the lowest notes in the bells. Mm. So they, <laughs> it's when the bells hum. So, yeah. It's what you hear <laughs> when you've rung the bells down. Yeah, yeah, it's the longest lived of the... Of all the sounds, of all, yes. Yeah, of, of all the The low tones. frequencies. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah, the higher frequency ones die away the quickest and then the lower frequency ones are left. Right. But of course it's the higher frequency ones that give you the strike note. So a bell where the, the hum is 
is a long way out from the strike note, you'll hear the strike and then it'll start humming but at a frequency that's kind of not related, mm. so it just doesn't sound right. There's no point making them too good, otherwise they just won't sound like they belong in the same ring of bells. And you get this ding, 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 clunk, clunk, clunk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you've taken a slight cut off the top. Yeah. To Do you call it a cut? Marshall. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's skirting cuts. And I'll take a, a, waist, uh, a cut out of waist to lower the hum. To lower the hum. hum. The hum, yes. Because yes. that, that's the area to lower the hum. Yeah, that's the area of the hum. Down here for the second partial, which is flat, so I won't be tuning it. Um, and the sound over the strike note. Different As you've got the bell facing upwards, the, the top part affects the strike. Yeah. The middle section affects the the, the hum. Yes. And the, and the bottom bit is is, is the second partial. That's the second partial. That's, that's the one that should be the same as half the nominal, but isn't necessarily. That's just a general rule of thumb. I mean, you, you take metal off anywhere, and all five frequencies move. The central part here is the Argent, and these six loops are the Gammons. Could you tell us why you've come up here today? Um, we've come to measure up the various bell pits, their length, their width, the height of the uh, pit, etc. And also the, um, the dimensions of the two larger bells, which of course are still up in the tower so that we can get the patterns set up to get the headstock castings uh, cast. That's it. That's two foot four and an ounce. 84, isn't it? Yeah. Why were you measuring that bit? So that we can use power and check that bit. Why did you just take the measurement from the floor to the girder there? Because um, when you have a double pulley on a bell, you have to draw the rope to draw the rope under. As you draw under, you've got to drop the pulley. And with a big bell like this, we can't drop it further than the floor is. Mm. For basically, um, you start off with four inches below the wheel as a standard, and then for every inch you draw under the wheel, you drop the pulley half that. So, you know, it's no, it's no good saying, right, we're going to have a seven foot wheel here, and we're going to draw it a foot, and find you run out of room. room. And that, of course, that, that measurement is to the top of the pulley, not the bottom. So you've got the depth of the pulley as well to consider. Brian's just saying oh, that the uh, oh, those the plates top. have been left on for now because they're useful for doing these measurements, but new plates will be put on. Are all the wheels being made completely new from scratch or are some just being adapted? Um, the 10 and 7 are new mm -hmm. and all the others have been adapted. So you, have you shortened the... Yeah, they've been shortened a bit. Right. So the circumference is going to be less on them. Yeah. 
Right. And what what wood are these? These new ones. Is that the Iroko wood? The same as the? No, they're Utley. Utley. How do you spell that? U T I L E. What are you actually doing with that bit now? Just uh, clamping it on, so that's the centre of the wheel. All right. Here. Mm. So I'm just cramping that in this, so it's in the centre. And then I can put the, put the other bits around. on around it. Yeah. How long are those screws you put in? Uh, 60 millimetres. Terry's standing by the new wheel for the tenor bell. What size did you say this was, Neil? 7 foot 1. So it's 7 foot 1, and is that? Once the rims are on, once the, once the shrouding's on top of the rim. The date 2007 on the tenor wheel there is to show the year that it's been made. What's the capital B for? That's Bampton. Oh, right, as simple as that. Job, yeah. <laughs> B for Bampton so we don't mix them up. So you steam them for three hours, wrap them round a metal jig, and yeah. you leave them on there for about so another three hours. hours. And then they keep the shape. Wooden jigs then. Ah. So that's then in a wooden jig, and that stops them from straightening out again. Yeah. Until they're ready to use. And what, <clears throat> what wood are they? They're ash. American white ash. When the rims have been steamed for three hours, that's the metal former that they are wrapped round and kept there for three hours before they transferred to the wooden jig where they're held until they're going to be used. This is the steamer for steaming the solings that go around the rim of the wheels. You can do four at one time and they steam for about three hours. You can do four at a time in here. It's 13 and a half feet long. Cut those. We're putting the wheel together so he can get the joints exactly right.
stock onto the top of the bell, um, got it central on the pad. What I'm going to do next is place it in the ringing jig and place a spirit level across the mouth of the bell to make sure that it's level. If it's not then the bell can be moved across the headstock until it is level. Place the spirit level across the mouth of the bell and see if it's level. So now move the bell across to the drill and drill four holes in it ready for the bumps. You say you're going to drill four holes. What are the holes for? Um, well, the holes will go through these ones in the headstock and then through the bell. And then the bolts will then be placed in those holes um, holding the headstock onto the bell. Um, this bolt that's in at the moment is just a temporary stocking down bolt. And when that's gone, eventually the clapper will be fixed through that one instead. now right through the headstock, the pad and the bell and uh, you can see the type of swarf that's come out, it shows it's a good quality bell metal. What, what are you looking at that tells you that's good quality? Um, it's a good colour, it's cut out in decent sized chunks, it's not powdery um, and that shows that it's a good solid cast. And what's the metal in there? Um, it's a type of bronze known as bell metal. 77% uh, copper, 23% tin, mm -hmm. and it's essentially the same 300 years ago as it is now. Our 7th and 8th bells are still up in the tower. How do you manage to do up there what you've just done with that great big machine? Well, in the tower we have um, a jig which clamps onto the bell and a very powerful mobile drill. Um, due to the size of the bells we decided to leave them in the tower and take all the kids upstairs with us. Um, so we can clamp the, the jig and the drill in place and just drill straight through. And then we can also balance the bell as I did just now in the, its own frame. And then with the stocking down bolt through the headstock and the bell again, we can use the same jig and the same drill to drill down through the four holes of the bolt. We also have to cast resin pads on top of those two bells. Um, so that will be done in situ, left to set, and then we'll come back and finish. Um, what I'll do when this comes off is to take that tape off mm -hmm. um, and fit the bearings over there. We've got some bearings similar in that frame over there. Although this is a slightly different design of headstock, uh, the principle's the same in that the steel gudgeon comes out of the side of the headstock and it's then mounted inside this bearing and bearing housing. And the bearing then clamps onto some bearing plates which will be fixed to the bell frame. And they'll all be fitted in the bells and tested before they come over to Bampton. You've just removed a plate, haven't you? Yeah, these are the old part, the old, the old bearings, that's all. So now they've been used as an aid for measuring, now they can come off and yeah, new gonna, ones going on. Yeah, we're going to make new ones. So you've taken the uh, headstock, the old, well, the Doncaster head off the bell. Off of that one, that one had a Doncaster clump. And this one didn't? This just had a little clump in the middle of the remains of the cannons. Oh, right. 
So now you've got the, uh, <laughs> the cake tin on it, for want of a better description. You, what have you used to seal it? It's just silicon. A silicon seal. Yeah. All right. The shiny area inside the uh, bell number three here is from it being tuned down the Whitechapel foundry in London. <laughs> The sealed bearings on one end of the fifth and sixth bells will be fastened onto this plate. If you remember, it used to look like this. Using the spirit level now to make sure the bottom of the bell hangs level. What was the problem you found? The bell isn't level, it's hanging at an angle. Ah, so I'm right. level it up now. How'd you do that? You want to try that? You're going to move the bell across on the headstock so, it's, so it hangs, so it's balanced. It's how you balance it. We're screwing one bolt in and screwing the other one out. We actually move the headstock across the bar. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Henceforth, world without end. Almighty God, be pleased to accept at your hands the offering of these bells. And all the work that has been done in this tower. Bless and sanctify and hallow these bells, and grant that their message may lift up the hearts of those who hear them to the praise of your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, world without end. Amen.
I would like all ringers to identify yourselves. <laughs> Anybody who rings, who has rung, who's ever laid hands on the room, and swung in earnest, please now. I could ask you to say together the dedication prayer of the bell ringers. Yes, if you've ever done it, if you've ever done it, please. I can't say this because I haven't. I'll start you off. We say together. As, As bell ringers, we, we dedicate our energy and skill to God's glory and determine that our ringing work will be our prayer. That is our resolve. Amen. As a congregation, we dedicate ourselves to the glory of God, our lives ringing out in praise and calling all people to worship the one who rejoices in heaven at the joy of all believers. Amen. The third bell is resting on the plates and it will stay there while they get the boards back in the floor underneath it. Then they will lift it a little bit more again and get the bottom half of the wheel in. There's the wheel braces going on the floor as well. The bottom half of the sixth bell wheel is being lifted and fastened to the top half. That is the double pulley wheel for the sixth bell and like the seventh the rope will be drawn under the bell and then go through the belfry floor where it will then go through the clock chamber and into the ringing chamber. Bring that wheel back off again. Move it this way a little bit. What, lifting it? No, just move it sideways. Oh right, so you've got play side to side as well as up and down. Well, I've got some spaces in there, yeah. Because it's, it's a little bit close to the edge of the pulley. Graham's put those spaces in to move that wheel across. This is the stay that's fastened to the sixth bell. That's the fourth bell wheel and its stay. And the two wheels closest to me are the sixth and then the fifth. There's the third over in the corner. The second and the trap's the tenor. And this is the seventh. This is where the rope will come from the centre of the wheel out through the rim. And if you look straight down, you can't see the pulley wheel. You have to come round a little bit. And there you can see it, and it's a double pulley wheel because the rope has to come in slightly underneath the wheel. That's the uh, clapper and the bottom of the third bell and over on the right you can see the slider board and the notch cut out of it is the area, the movement, amount of movement that the slider can make. It, it, it's fixed at the left hand side and that's the amount of movement that it could have when the stay comes over.
that's the wheel and you can see there how the bell itself fits into a space between the spokes of the wheel. James is sitting under the fourth bell attaching the slider. The clapper to the fourth. You can see the slider and the amount of movement that's allowed. About how long is that notch or that groove cut out of the slider board? About, I'm going to say inches, but that means nothing to you, does it? Um, well, yeah, we work to inches on them. Do you? It's all to do with the hang of the bell, how long the slot is, which we've got a, we've got a sheet at back of the works. So there's a set ratio of all the different measurements? There is, yeah. The stays have quite deliberately been made too long and Graham is bouncing the stay against the slider to put a little mark on it and then he can see where to cut it to make it the final correct length. He's now going to turn the bell over once more so that you can see how the stay leans against the slider and how the slider is restrained within the groove on the slider board. Upside down, not quite vertical, and when we stand the bell and say they're up, that's the position they're in. Just off vertical, with the stay leaning against the slider. And there it says Bampton treble, and it's in D flat, and all that shiny area is where the bell was cut in the tuning. That's the clapper leaning on the edge. And you can see the stay leaning against the slider. Right, that's the pulley wheel for the tenor bell. I've just threaded the end of the rope down between the pulley wheel and the block. And then down through that hole in the floor. And Graham is going to let's put it through the guide in the clock chamber and then it will go through the floor of the clock chamber to the ringing chamber. And they can't tie it onto the wheel yet until they know exactly how far to take it down into the ringing chamber. being threaded through the garter hole in the sole plate. It's the wheel of the third bell. This is the fourth bell being raised now and again Graham will find out where to cut the top of the stay to get it the right length. And also, he will watch and listen to make sure the clapper is what he calls striking true. Were you adjusting something there? Sorry? We're just in the clapper. And what is it you're actually doing with it? Moving it across? Yes. What was it that you could either see or hear that made you adjust it? If it's 
bias that strikes more on one side than the other. It's louder on one side and softer on the other, and we move it across it. I think it's I think that's all right. It kept changing over from one side to the other, didn't it? Try and peel, see what it's like. Now. Now that the bell ropes have been fastened to the seventh and the tenor bell, Graham and James are ringing them up using the ropes. This way they can feel if everything seems right to them. They will also find out how easily the bells will set at both hand stroke and back stroke. Hand stroke is there where they're holding the sally and back stroke is up at the top when they're reaching up. When they're reaching up at backstroke, they don't want a lot of rope flapping around in their face, so they will also be noticing at which point they need to fold the rope in half and then weave the tail end up into the rest of the rope itself. Both bells are now set at backstroke and see Graham on the left, he's just folded the rope over, now he knows that is where he wants the finished length of the rope and then he won't have a lot of tail flapping in his face when he's ringing, you can see the tail hitting him on the head right now. Having set the bell at backstroke, Graham is now going to set it at handstroke and He's having a little bit of difficulty, which means the groove in the runner board for the slider is not quite wide enough. The bell isn't leaning over quite sufficiently to make it easy to set it. And now James is going to do exactly the same thing with the tenor bell. I led it the film here because it took him absolutely ages to set it at hand stroke, which means it really does need the groove widening quite considerably. <laughs> so what? Explain why they were difficult to set. At hand stroke. A little bit fine set at the moment, we've got to go up and adjust it. Just a little bit out of the slot where we're sliding around. So the bell can lean over just a fraction farther? Yeah. James is threading the tail end of the rope up now. <laughs> 